so like this is the um, today we are going to cover the induction machines this is actually the last module in the PO exam so by the end of today yeah, th this session we will have you will have everything you need for the PEO exam. You can actually go to the previous exams and check any question. Okay, you don't have any limitations now. Okay, before we start, I uh, because I received a couple of questions now, let me try to explain and discuss with you, like having open discussion with you regarding, let's just start with the star delta line and phase uh, first, and then we can go for the second question regarding the synchronous relation. Okay, for star and delta and the uh, three phase in general. So by default, any voltage is given in the exam. It's the line voltage. This is the default. It's a line voltage. Whatever it's delta star or um, transmission line, because this is the, or these are the three options. So you may have a transmission line C phase, of course, you may have a load star or delta. So this is a star. Sometimes we call it Y or star. Okay. Load or delta. Load. You can have for the generator star and delta as well. So this is the generator star and delta. Okay, these are the three options that we can have. We can have a transmission line. This is a transmission line or a circuit. You can have a load star or Y and delta. You can have generator star and delta. Okay, as I said, all the voltages in the PO exam is they are a uh, voltage line. This is by default. And this is actually like in, in reality, when we define, for example, the, we say 500 kV transmission line, we are talking about the line voltage. Sometimes we call it line to line voltage, which is the line voltage. We are talking about if you have three phases, it's the voltage between the two phases, not one phase and the ground. And the difference, for example, if this, let's say 500 kilovolt, so to get the phase, for example, A to the ground, you have to divide this value by square root three. Okay. This is the phase one. It has a magnitude, of course not angle. Why we care about the phase and why you are not using the line? Because as we said, to solve any three phase circuit, we move to the single phase or pair phase. Similar to what we did for the synchronous generators, we solve the equivalent circuit pair phase, single phase. And um, yeah, we will do it today, actually in the induction machines. We are going to solve it. All the induction machines are three phase. Uh, at least in our course. And then we are going to move to the single phase or pair phase. Yes, we have, I have a question, please. Um, and, uh, sorry, Bahamut, I might be getting confused, but um, yes, sure. do you only divide by root three if it's like a, uh, if it's a star um, like generator? If it's a it's delta it. generator, don't you do, won't divide the current by root three? Yeah. It's, so here I divided it into three. The first is generator and transmission line. This is transmission line, and this is load. So oh, I what I was talking, yeah, what I was talking about is the one here in the transmission line. And this is the general. Like this is, we didn't say delta or star or anything, but we... It, the voltage given was um, uh, the line. And then we needed the phase per phase for this transmission line. Like it's something connecting A, B, C, let's say one to A, B, C, two. 
it just three phases connected from one point to another point without like generator or saying it, what the generator here or loads, but we are like it's a, a feeder. Sometimes we call it in the exam, a feeder connecting two circuits. Because but, but, I, I know that sorry, this if, is the if, point of confusion. Yeah. Yes. If, yes, if, please, that yeah, if that generator was a delta connection, then we would not be dividing by root three. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So let's, yeah, no problem. Let's go to the generator and then the load. So for the generator, similar to the transmission line for the star, if the given is 500 kV, then you need to solve the and the, use the phase. You have to divide it by the, this value by square root three to get the magnitude for this voltage. Okay, of course, there is um, angles are 120, sorry, 120 degrees difference between, uh, sorry, like this is the negative and this is the positive between A, B, C. Okay, three phases, and we always assume that they are balanced. Balanced magnitude, similar magnitude, and phase shift by 120 degrees. For the delta, if you have the voltage 500 kV, 500 kV is actually very, very large for the uh, generator, but I'm just using the same voltage as we used in the transmission. You will see that the voltage phase still the 500 kV. No, but the load, if you have the load star and you have the 500 kV, then you have to divide by square root three to get the voltage per phase. If you have delta load, and this is the 500 kV, then you don't have to divide it by anything. It's the same voltage for the phase, okay? However, for the load and the generator, we said we need to move part of our, um, for the C-phase circuit, part of our uh, solution, is to divide the circuit to star or to per phase and move any delta to star. So let's say we we don't have, of course, a neutral, but we put like a dummy a node here. It's not real. We put it here, or for the the, the delta load, we put it. We put one here, and then. We don't use the 500 kV anymore, but we can use divided by square root three just to get the voltage between one of the phases and this dummy node. So the voltage is in, in reality is not like this, but we use it to move the circuit per phase, phase as a single phase, solve it, and then go back to this. So you will solve your, your circuit per phase, you will get a voltage, let's say V. This is this is the voltage, the per phase. This is not a real voltage. You cannot get or calculate or measure this voltage. But you have to divide to multiply this, multiply, not divide, multiply by square root three to get the line back here. And this is the, the actual voltage across the phase of the load. I know like sometimes it's uh, especially the delta is doing some confusion because of the um, this uh, dummy node that we use. We use the dummy node only to make this per phase. Because per phase here, you don't have per phase for the delta. You have to first move it to star or y, and then go to the per phase. Okay, similar to the generator. You will get for the generator, you will get a voltage, and I believe we have uh, one in the, um, uh, like the um, assignment one. So we got this voltage, and then we multiply by square roots, sorry, in the midterm, and we multiply by square root three to get the voltage of the uh, generator, All right? the generator because this voltage is not a real, it's just a dummy voltage. It's a, the per phase, yes, 
we divided this by square root three to we'll get this, or if you get this, you multiply by square root three to get the voltage here, but this is not a real uh, voltage. It's just the one that you use to solve the three phase. Okay. But for the, the good one, like here, it's the for the transmission line, the given is, or feeder, the given voltage is a line, and you have to divide it by square root three, make a dummy, again, like a node here to get it per phase. Sometimes we call this one as a ground, for example. So this is the phase voltage or phase uh, to ground, for example, voltage. The line voltage, we call it line to line or sometimes line voltage, okay? Uh, this is the main, you know, like summary of everything. Like you will not find anything outside this one or outside our, you know, uh, I can, I can try to uh, do something for the synchronous because we solved with some of the synchronous machines last time. So for the synchronous machine, when once we, we see it's a star, we solve it per phase again. So we divide the voltage per phase because this voltage will, will be, for example, this voltage will be the per phase voltage. Okay, so we divide this whatever voltage given by square root three to get this voltage, right? Because look at this one, this is the voltage we have and this is the given. So you divide by square root three. However, if the, the, the synchronous machine is Delta like this, once you have the voltage, you will use it directly. It will be this voltage immediately. Because you don't have to go to per phase for the synchronous. We go to per phase just to solve the three phase circuits, not the synchronous. For the synchronous, we are going to solve it like this. However, the currents, let's go to the currents. The currents here in the synchronous for the delta, if you have delta connected and synchronous machine, the look at the volt, the current here, the current per phase is different than the current, the uh, current in the line by square root three. So once we have a current here, you have to multiply by square root three to go to the line one, the line here. Okay. So I know since we, you know, covered the synchronous, we started to have a confusions for the um, uh, three phase. In the three phase, you have to go per phase to solve. And if you have delta, you have to move it to star. In the synchronous, we don't move to, from delta to star. Yes, we solve it per phase, but you don't have to move from delta to star. You solve the delta as a delta per phase. You have a star, you, have a star, you solve your star as uh, per phase, okay? But you don't have to move from one to another. This is, you know, like the whole summary and we will do the same for the synchronous, we will do the same with the induction machines today. Is it, um, you know, clear or Should we do, or do you have any questions for any part? Like this is, you know, a part of our discussion just to make things are uh, clear, very clear for you. Mohammed, I, I just have a question. If you have a generator connected sure. to a three, three phase AC motor, um, is that three phase AC motor automatically like a Delta connection or would you have to look that up? Uh, so you have a three phase uh, star or Y connected a synchronous, right? And yeah. it's connected to a connected to a load. Uh, the load is given like a star or delta or no? Like let's say if it's a uh, like a uh, like on a locomotive. 
if it if it's a okay. onboard generator, uh, yeah, no, and it's connected to like an AC traction motor. Yes, no, not a problem. So you have the load. You don't know if it's a Y or delta. That's completely fine. You have the the currents given. These are the inputs to your load. You can have for this pro kind of problems, all you need because it's a load and all you need, and we have some kind of these uh, problems in the um, uh, exams. You need to know the power, for example, for your load, the three phase load. You need to uh, know the, maybe like the power factor. Okay, maybe the current, the voltage needed. So you have the four things here, like the current voltage. Sometimes we, we call the S, but you can, the S magnitude, the apparent power. But if you have the power and power factor, that's that's the S, right? You can, you can get the S. So it's, this is, that's it. You don't need to do anything. For the power, for example, it's square root three. This is what I'm going to use. V line, I'm going to take this voltage, V line. I line, this is the I line. And cosine the angle, theta or phi, sometimes we call it theta or phi. So this is the power for the three phase load without knowing what kind of load we have. These equation are all good. If the, the it's a delta or a star or y, these or the, this equation is valid. And this is actually that that we we always use actually like for for the um, uh, unknown loads. Let's say like it's unknown connection of loads. Like, we don't know how it's connected inside, but all we need is the uh, terminals values, like the voltage, current, and power factor. Okay. Thank you. Is this yeah clear or okay? Good. Any more kind of questions for this part? The star delta. Okay, if no questions, let's go to the second questions. And this is very good. Like the discussions here is very important to make everything is clear before, you know, like uh, you see or solve the problems just to make sure you understand the, the um, you know, the topic very well. The second question was regarding the SP or let's call it like the droop. So in general, even like in reality, all the generators or generation stations connected to the grid, they have something called the droop, okay? Sometimes we call it the governor droop or droop characteristic for the generators. Why we have this droop? Uh, this droop is kind of sharing the power between the generators. If the frequency changes of the, like the frequency of the system, usually the frequency in the system is 60 Hertz. As long as it's 60 Hertz, for example, uh, here in Canada, then it's good, it's fine. If it's moving, let's say less than 60, then you have to make something to increase it to, again, to 60. So if it decreases, decreases with once like it decreases it means the loads is greater than the generation okay because 60 hertz it means the generation equals to the load of course it's a generation equals to the loads uh plus the losses of course but let's say let's say it like the loads are loads included the losses so generation equals to the loads it means a balance between them and 60 hertz. If the loads are greater, then the frequency drops. If the loads are less or the generation is larger, then you have higher frequency than 60 hertz. Like let's say 61, here like it's 59, for example. Once the, the frequency is decreasing, you need something automatically to, sh to make all the generators in the system to react to this low frequency. And, you know, they should give some power. 
to make the balance between the generation and the load. Back again. How we do this? By the droop. So each generation, you have a settings and you can change it actually. So what is the droop? It's, let's say you have a power here called, this is the full load of your generator. This is the power and this is the frequency, or we said maybe like the speed, both are, are the same. Frequency equals the number of the pools number, uh, times N over 120. Number of the pools for the machines are always constant. 120 is a constant, so the frequency is almost similar to the speed, or at least proportional with the speed. So frequency or speed, and you have this slope. Once you have the more load to your generation, you will find that your frequency drops to this value. If you have less loads, then you will have higher frequency. Okay. So how can we change this? If you have more load, let's say here, then the frequency drops. And you need to increase your or return your frequency back to the 60 hertz, let's say. The full load is the 60 hertz. How can we do this? You open the valve, for example, if you have a steam, you take more power from your steam. Or if you have hydro, you open the gates for the more water to increase your prime mover and power. Once you do this, it means you are moving this up. You are moving this line up. You can move it until this point is here. Let's say you have this. This is by opening the valve. Okay, opening the gates or pushing more power to the system. So you will serve the same load give the same load, but now the frequency is returned to the 60 Hertz back again, okay? which is the a normal um, value or rated value. So the slope here, let's, let's get what is the slope. The slope here or this one, it's uh, Y over X. Y is the frequency in Hertz. X is in sometimes kilowatt or megawatt. Uh, hertz, or we can call it, if it's a speed, RPM over uh, kilowatt. The slope here, one over the slope is one over, uh, is like the, the SP. So SP actually, it's the kilowatt per needed per hertz, or the kilowatt or megawatt per uh, RPM speed needed, okay? And this is actually the change between like how, how many frequencies I'm going to lose if the power increased by this value. So if you multiply the SP times the frequency at no load minus the frequency of the system, this is actually the power. So you can, you, for example, you can, if the frequency of the system equals to the frequency of no load, this is the zero power. It's here, this point. If you included, you, you want to know the frequency of the system, the 60 Hertz, use the slope, add your, add your power and the no load frequency, you will know this. So if you have the no load frequency and you know the slope and your power, you will get the frequency of the system or the frequency of your uh, generator. So this is the summary of the SP. For we have multiple cases for the SP, and we did like three, sorry, four um, cases. The first one, if you have one generator and you are changing the loads, you add more loads, you remove the loads. And this is the first point here we included, like generator with multiple loads. This is the solved example in the textbook. So you have one generator given the SP, no load frequency, and this is the system frequency. 
you change, you, you add more load. Of course, this one is constant as long as you didn't change the uh, governor, open the valving uh, or the valves or, or uh, the gates or closing. And this is always constant. Okay, for the same machine, as long as you didn't change your uh, settings, then you will get the frequency of the system. And as we said, you add more loads, the frequency drops. You remove the loads, the frequency will increase. Okay. Second case, it was the um, infinite bus. So infinite bus, it means whatever your loads, infinite bus, it, it means like you have a very large generation, not just one, a lot of generation connected together making a big system or a strong system. So the frequency is always constant at 60 Hertz. Whatever you are doing, the frequency is 60 Hertz. This is something we call it like the SP will be like infinity. You add load or remove your loads, generation or motor, always your frequency constant at 60 Hertz. And it represents like a, a big or a strong system. Okay. Okay. What if we included, uh, added a generator to this strong system to infinite bus? So this is your infinite bus. This is your generation. For infinite, your infinite bus is. Uh, the slope is zero, like, like or SP is infinity, okay? However, your generator, it's, you know, like the similar to the generation. Like if you have uh, more power, you will have less frequency, like less frequency, okay? Or frequency drops. So this is your frequency. If you have this generation, you can, for example, move this to here. If you move this one to here, it means your intersection is here. It means your generation is not generating anything. Like the intersection is here. It means it's zero. You can move it even lower by closing the valve. Your generator will be motor absorbing power from the infinite bus. Because the infinite bus is making the frequency always constant at 60 hertz. So you put your, if your no load frequency is higher than 60, then you will generate. Higher than, no load frequency higher than 60, it means before you connect to your, the grid with no load, you are trying to have, or you having a speed like faster than 60 Hertz. So once you connect, you will be, at the 60 Hertz, exactly 60 Hertz, because we are connected to a very strong system. So where is the power? Before you connect, you were rotating at more than 60 Hertz. Now you connect it to the grid, you are forced to move with the 60 Hertz. Where is the difference? Is the power you are pushing to the system. What if you were connected or you were rotating at 60 hertz before you connect to the grid or to the loads. And you connected the 60 hertz, you are not going to push any, anything. So the no load, your no load at 60 hertz. What if you were rotating at lower than 60 hertz and you are connected to the grid to the 60 hertz, you will actually take more power to be with this speed. So this is your power. You will be a motor, not generator. Okay. So next is if you have two generators not connected to a strong system, forcing your frequency to be to be six hertz. So two generators, you have two. This is how we um, uh, do it. Let's say like this is generator number two. This is your characteristic for generator number one. Each one they have their own no load frequency. Okay, and of course, they are having different slopes given. Okay, for example, for this case, you have this, this is your load at certain frequency, 
So this is this will be the generation for G1, and this is for G2. If uh, we solved one so, uh, problem last time from the exams, I believe. So if you reduced your load, you will go to higher frequency, and the, the power sharing or distribution will be different between the generation. And we calculated this in the uh, last time. Okay. And also last time we uh, discussed the, the speed regulation. It's a speed regulation or because it's a speed and we said the speed is similar to the frequency as a ratio. So we can use this as a frequency. If they said the speed regulation at full load, then you can use the frequency at the full load. Okay, which is usually 60 hertz or, or 50 hertz. If they didn't say, you can assume that it's given at the frequency given in the system. For example, I believe in our assumptions, we used it at 70, uh, 57 hertz. Okay, you can assume, like write your assumptions. For example, you say, if there is like a confusion, you can write your assumption. You say, okay, like let's assume this. If they didn't say it's a full load or no load, you can solve it for both because we discussed this last time. My solution was based on the frequency in the uh, problem. However, you uh, ask it if can we use it for the full load? If you you can write the assumptions and you can use it for the full load, definitely. Okay, because in the exam, sometimes you have to write some try or at least like try to to write as much as possible for the assumptions you are doing, okay? There are things that you cannot assume in the exam. For example, as we discussed, the line voltage is given. You cannot use this voltage as a phase, for example. You cannot, okay, I'm going to assume that this voltage is a phase because by default, the given is the line voltage or line to line. Okay, but something like this, like the speed regulation, that's that's completely fine. You can write your assumptions. I, I saw it like this is the one. You said, no, no, maybe it's the full load. That's completely correct. Like both are okay. Write your assumptions and solve the problem. Okay. Is this... Uh, clear or do you need more or do you need like um, uh, to discuss anything for the slope the sp this is the problem that we solved last time okay and uh, this is the 57 oh yeah i was talking about this one so it's uh, we use the 57 instead of 60 but yeah, it's. I assume that this S is not for the for load. If you want to assume this is for for load, put the sixty. That's fine. That's completely fine. Okay. Do you need any more explanation, or do you have any other questions? Okay, no questions. Let's, um, but this is good. Like it's very good that we do the discussion to make sure that you have like, you completely understand the topic. Let's um, continue what we are doing. Uh, I'm opening now the outline. Uh, we are in our meeting number nine. We finished, actually, we now we are in a very good position. We finished everything that we need to finish by, by meeting eight. Today, we are going to discuss the induction machines. Hopefully, we are going to finish it. Uh, we have a couple more uh, meetings before the exam. The two more meetings are, first, we are going to do the transmission lines. This is optional. It's not in the PO exam. I'm going to cover it very fast. And then I'm going to use the session for the rest of the session, uh, maybe like more than a couple of hours to solve the problems from the past exams. 
Next uh, session will be completely solving uh, problems step by step. Make sure that you understand everything. You can use the next couple of weeks on, uh, you know, uh, ha having like um, a look for the past exams. You can choose the problems that you um, we need to discuss during our sessions. But if not, that that's not 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 a prop because I have a list of problems that I um, I picked to cover all the ideas. So it's. Uh, but in case you have any problems, you can add in in the list of the problems that I'm going to solve and discuss. And next time also, we are going to cover question five, which is uh, the one I uploaded last time. So we can discuss some of the knowledge questions too. Okay. Today is the induction machines module number nine. Uh, as I said, hopefully we are going to finish it. Uh, we have, it's a chapter number seven in our uh, textbook, uh, the Chapman one. Okay, I included the sections that we are going to cover from almost 7.1 to 7.9. We are going to cover almost everything. The chapter is induction, not machines, but induction motors. Okay, we are going to discuss what is the difference between the induction motors and induction generators in general. Okay, so for this, let me put it like in a full screen. As I said, it's module number nine, last module be for the PO exam. Uh, next one is optional, the transmission line, and then um we are going to have a review of previous exams questions so what are we going to cover today is the list here or the like the outcomes here the first one is the main parts for the induction machines okay the, the main parts like the um, stator generator we will see uh, different um, construction for the rotor, for example, for the induction uh, machines or motors. We are going to have a quick explanation how the induction motor, as you see here, now I, I started to use motors, um, the operation of the induction motor and how the torque is developed in the asynchronous, sorry, like there is a space here, the asynchronous motor, one, one um, uh, name for the induction motor is the asynchronous motor. It's not like synchronized. It's not like uh, the synchronous machine. The next step is to use the equivalent circuit, okay, and actually calculate the the parameters of the equivalent circuit, similar to what we did with uh, other machines. Then we will have the power flow losses, the efficiency, and this one is very important. We will see like different powers um, at different uh, steps for the induction machine. We are going to cover something also important. It was part of the uh, one of the like, knowledge uh, question in the exam is the speed torque characteristic of the induction machine, okay? Induction machine, because we are going to, for the speed torque, we are going to cover the generator, the motor, and the braking. Okay. We have four sections. We are going to start with the equivalent circuit uh, after like a very quick introduction. Uh, then the power flow. Last step is the speed torque characteristic, and we are going to solve some of them important examples okay before we start the details of like the uh, topic for uh, today like the induction machines as we said we have dc machines and ac machines okay we covered first uh, module for the rotating machines. We covered the DC machines, the direct current machines. And for the AC machines, we have two. Last uh, two modules, we covered the synchronous machines. 
we finished the synchronous machines. The first AC machine today is the second AC machines. Okay, the induction. So for the synchronous, as we said, and we saw last time, like we have, um, uh, so like this, these are the two AC machines. So for the synchronous machines, we said, okay, we have, uh, we may have like a um, generator, which is the main, maybe like application for the synchronous uh, machines. And we can have like motors. It can be lagging, leading, or even unity power factor, like unity power factor, okay? For the induction machines, you will see, in reality, we can have it as a generator or motor, okay? Mainly for our course, we cover the motor only. We're not going to cover the generator. Do we have a generation uh, as an induction? Yes. We have uh, mainly in the wind turbines, there are four main types of the wind turbines. The third type, type three, it's using the induction generation or generator. Okay, so this is one of like the renewables uh, and the uh, type three of the wind using the induction uh, generator. But in our course, we are not going to cover this. For the synchronous machines, all the cases were three phases, right? Similar to the induction machines, all we are going to cover is three phases. So you have delta, star, connection, uh, line and phase as we discussed. Do we have a single phase induction motor? Yes. And this is actually very common used mainly for the uh, in the air conditioner for example for the houses you it's mainly like single phase induction motors but again in our course we are going to cover only the three phase one okay but single phase induction motors yes they are you know existed and very common for some kind of applications the most common one we, you can see is the air conditioner. Okay. Okay. So the next slide, as we said, the these two slides are all in all uh, our modules, rotating machines modules. So I'm going to cover today is like the, the second bullet here is like the induction motor. Okay, or workhorse, like as we said. So this one is used from a very low power to very high to megawatts, mainly the air conditioners, all the compressors, fans, uh, cranes, elevators, electric vehicles, of course. So it's a very, very important one. And it's replaced the DC motors almost in everything. and. Um, the main reason is that uh, the maintenance for the DC machine or DC generators or motors uh, are very, um, you know, uh, large because they have the brushes and the commutators and they need a lot of maintenance. For the induction motors, some of them are like can work for years without maintenance. Okay, that this is the mean. So the 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 reason is the um, robustness of the induction motors. So they replaced almost all the DC uh, motors applications by using the induction. Okay. So let's start with the induction machine in general or induction or asynchronous as we said. So it's not synchronized. The parts. For the parts, we have mainly similar actually to the um, in DC and the synchronous. We have a stator and we have rotor. Okay. 
stator, it's stationary. Rotor is the one is rotating. It's a rotating machine. Okay, both are three phase, three phase, three phase. Okay, we will see what is the meaning for the end phase, but both, let's say, they are three phase. And we can do it like this. So the rotor, and then you have the generator. Sorry, let me go back. Yeah. This is stator and rotor. So this is the stator, this is the rotor. You have slots and you have winding. As you can see, this is the stator and the windings included inside the slots, the conductors. At the end, they are three phases, okay? Phase A, B, and C. Connected because it's a motor, electric motor, so connected to three phase supply here. A, B, and C. Okay, supply. For the rotor, it's three phase. We have two different, um, you know, uh, um, construction for the rotor. Let's discuss what is like the one we have here. It's the wand rotor. So what is like the wand rotor? The wand rotor, you have windings, slots again, and you have winding for three phase, A, B, and C connected together. The three phase in the rotor are short-circuited. So if you have A, B, and C, they are star connected, for example, they are short-circuited. They are just some winding inside the rotor, short-circuited. This is the, as we said, like the wand rotor. You can have something, we call it squirrel cage. So it's like two rings connected by a certain kind of bars. It's similar to this, right? It's some conductors and short circuit again. There is no source or inputs or something. Okay. And this is, we call it like the squirrel cage rotor. You can have one rotor or squirrel cage rotor. Okay. So it's short circuited. There is uh, some advantages and disadvantages for both. For example, for the squirrel cage, it's a very good in, there is no maintenance. It's a very robust, even more than the um, wand router. There is no short circuit or like a um, problem in the windings or something. So it's a very uh, robust. Lifetime is much higher. The wand router, uh, they have advantage because it's, um, they are windings, right? And because both are rotors, are they are rotating, right? You can have or add slip rings, connect each phase to the slip rings, and have access to the rotor. You can put, for example, a resistance in the rotor and control the resistance of the rotor. And this is what we can see it here from the uh, cutaway uh, for this rotor. You can see the winding here for the rotor. This is a one uh, rotor construction. Okay. And you can find like slip rings and brushes. You can add three brushes here. I believe you can see the brushes. At, this is one, this is two, and this is three. And then you can have access to the three phase of the rotor which is short circuit. At the end, you will put like a resistance, but at the end, you will do short circuit. But you have access to the resistance. You can add resistance or remove resistance. Like you can you can control the resistance by adding resistance, increase it and decrease it. This one is important to control something. We will discuss it later in this uh, module. So one router or squirrel cage. Squirrel cage, lifetime is better. One rotor, not that great, but you have access to the um, rotor circuit and you can control the resistance for the circuit, the rotor circuit. Okay. 
both are short circuited. And this is what we discussed here. What is like the meaning for the end phase? You can have, for example, three phases or even multiple, like six phases, for example, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter for the rotor. You can have multiple phases here. At the end, they are short circuited. Okay. Snip rings allow the electric connections to the rotor circuit, mainly to add resistance in the rotor. Okay. One point here, because we included here, it's that we screwed them in case you have like uh, slots. We do it, we twist these slots. As you can see, it's not, they are not straight. They are slightly twisted in, in one of the direction to eliminate some kind of like harmonics. So we call it like slot harmonics. Okay. So this is the main, like the basics actually for the construction for the induction machine. You have three phase in the stator connected to your source because it's a motor. You have maybe like three phase or multiple phases in the uh, rotor. You have con the construction, you have one rotor or um, squirrel cage. They are both uh, short circuited. Okay. Uh, this is like uh, just to show you that the induction motor is quite old. You can see like a very large one, uh, um, maybe like 2000 horsepower. This is a very, very big one. Okay. Connected in one of the factories. And this is like a very, very old one. So induction machines was there for a very long time. Getting a lot of... Um, you know, like um, applications from the DC machines, like compared to the DC uh, machines, especially recently. Okay. So let's start the basics of the induction machines, especially like the operation also. So how it's operate, like the induction machine, like the operation, you have Rotor, three phases, sh uh, short circuited. You have stator, three phases, connected to a supply. You connect your machine to your, the, the, your machine to a source. Then the current will flow in the stator, three phase, of course. Three phase with the frequency of the synchronous of your source. Sometimes you call it like the F of the synchronous, F of the electric source. And then the current will flow here with this frequency. Because the current flow inside the stator, it will make a magnetic field. Magnetic field, it will make a voltage, induce the voltage in, inside your um, short-circuited uh, circuit of the rotor. Because of this voltage, you will have a current. After having a current, you will have another magnetic field. Two magnetic fields, one from the rotor, sorry, one from the stator, this, and one from the rotor. They will interact with each other, and your rotor is going to rotate. The interaction, because it's it's like a magnet, uh, it's... um. Three phase, okay. The currents, three phases, A, B, C. The magnetic field is three phase, which is rotating, rotating with a frequency equal to the synchronous. Then, because you have like a rotating magnetic field, after you induce, like after you generate this um, magnetic field for the rotor, it will try to catch the one from the synchronous. Okay. So it's like rotating magnetic field is as you have like a magnet moving 
okay, or rotating with the synchronous speed. Your rotor has like another magnet. You are trying, for example, you have north and south here, and you have south and north for the uh, rotor. So this trying to catch this, and this trying to catch the other one. Because of this, you will find something called, and we will we are going to discuss uh, later in the next slide, I believe, something called the slip. Slip, it means the speed of your rotor is not going to, to reach to the synchronous speed. It's something lower, something lower. Yes, I believe we have a question, please go ahead. Yes, Mohammed. I'm just wondering. Uh, there's also poles inside your induction motor as well, right? Uh, for this, it's um, you can you can say the router will have uh, a kind of like poles, but it's not. It's not given um, for the router definitely, but it's uh, it's uh, and we can of course. Uh, uh, calculate them. Yes, yes. This is of course uh, uh, valid for the in induction machines. We have like this kind of poles, but um, the idea is that we don't have a source for the magnetic field. The source of the magnetic field is actually the the, the main source you connect. So this source, it's the electric source plus. The magnetic field, remember when we have like, uh, when we said for any motor, for example, or generator uh, motor, you will have the electric, electric motor, to electric uh, inputs to the mechanical inputs. However, we need the magnetic field. So both the magnetic field and the electric source is from one source, is the main source. Okay. This, this actually is similar to the DC. Uh, if you remember, or like the shunt DC motor, you have one source doing both, like um, the field and giving power to the armature. Okay. For the generator, you will have the mechanical, and again, like uh, it will be like electric, but you need the magnetic field. Without the magnetic field, you're not going to do, or you are not going to have um, the output. Okay, mechanical or electrical for the generator and the gene like the uh, motor. Okay, but yes, like for your question, yes, we have like a poles for the induction. It's inside, like you, you can you can um, uh, by like having the north or calculating the number of the north and the south, you can get the values for the. Uh, or like the number of the poles, yes. And both like the rotor, you will have something, for example, like opposite, and they will try to catch the other, uh, attract each other, right? You, they are trying to move with the speed, trying to catch the other uh, or different poles for the thing for, from the stator, okay? This is just a quick, hopefully I answered your uh, your question. Is it? Uh... I know you did, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thanks so much. And this is like a, a very quick, uh, like a brief introduction about like the basics of the operation for the induction motors mainly, or even the generator. You can, you can think about the generator. Okay, what if I have a generator? How can we um, get the magnetic field? It will be first connect your generator to the grid. If you have the wind, for example, the type three, as we said, you connect it to the grid. It will get the magnetic field from the grid. Then it will start to generate the active power. By this, you can, you can know that all the induction machines are lagging power factor. Lagging, it means they are taking reactive power from the grid, from the supply, okay? And the mainly because, because of this, 
is they are the source of the magnetic field for the machine. So whatever you are connected to a source, okay, you are getting the magnetic field from this source. Okay, the reactive power. Okay. So, and like this is like, um, again, like a couple of uh, points here that, as we said, we always uh, use the balanced three-phase stator currents will produce magnetic field. Let's say it like it's the stator one, okay? And rotates with the synchronous speed. This is important. Then let's assume that the, the your rotor is not rotating or stand still or lock the rotor. They are all for the same... Uh, like same meaning, it means the speed is zero. Your rotor is not rotating. So you will have a voltage. We call it the rotor voltage. The rotor voltage will have the frequency of the synchronous frequency. If you look at this, it will be similar to the transformer. If you have three phases connected to the stator, this is your stator. This is your stator. And you have your rotor. Let's assume it's a three-phase, short-circuited. This is your rotor. It's the it's like similar to sh uh, sh short-circuited transformer, right? So you have a voltage here, same frequency as this one. Okay. Once your rotor started to rotate, the frequency of this voltage will be different. Unless it's not rotating, it will be transformer, right? Transformer. If you remember for the transformer, we use the single frequency. We don't have different frequencies for the primary and secondary. For example, we have, uh, or we had like the same frequency, both in the, uh, you know, uh, secondary and primary. For this one, it will be a transformer. Sometimes we call actually the induction machines as a rotating transformer. It's including part that is rotating. So the frequency will be different. So what will be the frequency? If you compare the one at the locked rotor, locked rotor, it means it's you are uh, stopping your rotor from rotation. Sometimes you can stand still or not rotating. We compare this voltage with the uh, voltage when it's rotating. So this is the difference in the frequency, actually. So omega m is the speed this, the, 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 the speed of rotation in radian per second, of course, of your rotor. If you put this one zero, you will find that the er equals to the e locked rotor, right? If it's not rotating, it will be similar, right? If it's rotating, you have omega m, then there is a difference in the frequency. You can get, how, how did I get this equation? It's um, E equal K phi omega. So you have one, one, and you have another one, E2, and K phi omega two. Take this ratio. K is constant for the same machine. Phi is the flux. And then you have E1 over omega 1 equals to the E2 over omega 2, right? And for the one for the rotor, if it's rotating, then your speed will be omega synchronous minus omega of the, mot of the um, motor. The logged rotor, it will be the, the, the frequency is the synchronous one. Okay, so you can use this equation, okay, to get the ER. So there is a difference between the uh, um, speeds. It's the speed of the synchronous minus the one mechanical. And the frequency for the rotor, it's the... Uh, Compared to the, fr the frequency of the synchronous, it's omega synchronous minus omega m over the omega synchronous. Or 
you can say it's the frequency of the rotor, it's the difference between the two omegas over two pi. Okay. So this is actually the main uh, point. Once you have stator, you have a rotor, the rotor is short circuited. The, once your, your uh, rotor is rotating, the frequency here is different than the main frequency, the main synchronous frequency. Okay, so synchronous frequency is 60 hertz, 50 hertz, whatever is connected from, you, it depends on your supply. This one is different. Okay. We can, I believe we passed the time for, um, you know, like a break. So we can take a very quick break and then we can come back. So any question for, uh, for this part, the main point for, from like the, this slide is to show you that we will have different frequencies than the synchronous inside the rotor. And mainly is that it's due to that it's rotating. Okay. If you want to make like a, um, like a comparison between the induction machine and the synchronous machine. The synchronous machine, we use like a DC uh, source as a field. Now, this time we are using a short circuit and we depend on the, uh, from the rotor, we depend on the stator supply. Okay. Okay. And let's go to the next step, which is the equivalent circuit. And you can see from the equivalent circuit for this slide that it looks like the transformer, right? It's transformer short circuit transformer. So the first point is that we only use the three phase for the induction. So this one is per phase. We have the stator. This part is the stator, okay, stator here. And the one we used to call it like secondary, now it's the rotor, R. We have R for the rotor, XR for this, the rotor, X1, we call it, for the stator, R1 for the stator, RC and XM, it's just for both, but we put like a branch similar to exactly like the, to the transformer, we have, um, this one should be a resistance, not an inductor. Uh, it's uh, one for the copper lo uh, core losses, okay? And one for the magnetization. We call this one uh, magnetization branch. Sometimes we call it like excitation branch, okay? We have the stator current. We have the rotor current, okay? Um, and you know, like each each one, like for example, the winding resistance, this is for the copper losses. Okay, copper losses for stator and rotor. Um, the leakage for stator and rotor. And then core losses, magnetization. Okay, it's exactly similar to the uh, transformer equivalent circuit. We're not going to use the approximate equivalent circuit. We are going to solve it like this. Uh, we are going to do the referring mainly from the rotor to the stator. We are not going to move uh, backward, but we are going to move from the rotor to the stator. You will see in next in, in the steps, okay, in the next slides. Okay, so it's, it's as I said, we, they, they used to call it rotating transformer. We have turns ratio, yes, we have it, but usually it's not, we are not going to use it. We are going to, to have the main uh, resistance and uh, uh, reactants, both are referred to the stator, okay? Even the given ones will be referred, they will say like, okay, this one is referred to, to the stator. So 
why we have like effective um, uh, turns ratio, because for the, like let's say the stator, you have many windings for the stator, but less winding in the rotor, okay? Then you will have a turns ratio. Let's say like this one, each five volt will be like one volt. So it's like a turns ratio. If this one is one and one, then effective turns ratio is one. We say like effective because sometimes it's not winding. It's a, uh, remember, it's like a bars and rings. So you don't have actual winding. So it's like effective kind of turns issue. Okay. So let's discuss the meaning of slip. So we said, we will have a rotor and stator. For the rotor, it's going, um, let's talk about the stator first. The stator, you have the magnetic field is rotating by omega synchronous or the frequency of the synchronous. It depends on the supply. The rotor will rotate with the speed, okay, omega m. It's different than the synchronous speed. If you reach it to the synchronous speed, it will be transformer, right? It will be exactly like transformer short circuit. If it's, uh, uh, sorry, if, if this one is, is stopped or stand still, it will be a transformer. If it's moving, then it will be like with a different frequency. You have, here you have frequency of the synchronous. Here you will have the frequency of the rotor. Okay. So the difference between the speeds, we have it, it's called the slip. So the slip is the difference between the speed or the frequency is both are same, the synchronous and the motor. This one is like, or like the rotor speed. Sometimes you call it like the M for mechanical rotation. And again, we, we divide it by this one to make it like normalized, okay, similar to the period. So for the slip or S, this one is very important. You will see it a lot. We have different options. I believe like we have five here. The first one, if you have logged rotor, as we said before, logged rotor, it means your rotor is not rotating. It's a standstill. So omega m is zero, right? Omega m is zero. You will see s equals to one because omega m equals to zero. If the rotor is rotating slower than the synchronous speed, this is the case for the motor. This is the case for the motor. So omega m will be less than, uh, of course, it's higher than zero. Okay, higher than zero, it means uh, this is omega zero, higher than zero. So you have a value here, but it will not reach to the omega s. So s will be between zero to one, zero to one. One when the omega m equals to zero, zero when omega m equals to omega synchronous. So it would be something in between. Okay. What if you reach it to the rotor speed, reach it to the synchronous speed? This equals to this. S will be zero. What if omega m now is larger than the omega synchronous? What will happen? S will be negative. What if your rotor speed is reversed in reverser? It means omega m negative, less than zero or less than zero. If this one is negative, then S will be, so it will be omega synchronous plus something. It will be greater than one. 
So you have like the, these are the five options we have for the slip. Definition of the slip is the, the slip between the synchronous speed, the rotation of the supply the, of the rotating machine uh, or rotating field and omega M, the mechanical speed or the speed for the rotor. So what is the frequency of in the rotor? The frequency in the rotor, it's uh, the frequency of the synchronous, but multiplied by S, the slip. The slip is the difference between them. This is the frequency of the rotor. Okay. The mechanical speed from this equation, you can write omega M will be equal to one minus S times omega synchronous speed or electric speed, omega E or omega synchronous. Or you can use, instead of omega, you can go to the, because it's a ratio, right? You can use it as RPM. Very important equations you will see that we are going to use in our um, problems. What is the slip? Values of different slip is important. Frequency of the rotor which is different than the synchronous frequency. It will be equal to the frequency when, when S equals to one, when it's the logged rotor. It will be exactly similar to the transformer. Transformer, you have the primary and secondary, they have the same frequency, six hertz, for example. Okay. And omega M, it's one minus S over omega synchronous sorry, times omega synchronous. Okay. This is the slip. So, oops, I have something in the, okay. So, the equivalent circuit, we will return back to the equivalent circuit. We are going to use the S, the slip. For this one, this is the equivalent circuit. We are going to drive the equivalent circuit uh, later. But uh, the equivalent circuit, just the main components, we will have resistance. We call it the stator copper loss. Resistance for the stator. Resistance, this is referred to the stator from the rotor. Rotor copper loss referred to the stator. As you can see, we connect it to here. We have leakage in the stator. Leakage in the rotor refer to the stator. As you can see, we use the A effective here. We call the stators one with the two. The rotor, uh, sorry, the rotor one with the two, the stator with the one. Even I1 is the stator, I2 is the rotor current, refer to the stator, of course. You have leakage, uh, sorry, uh, magnetization reactants and core losses. So what is this value? Like why we have something here? We are going to have proof for this. Let's start the proof and then return back again to this equivalent circuit. But this is what you will see and use actually to solve in the problems. Voltage because we have three phase, this voltage is the pair phase, okay? Any questions so far for the induction? We are going to cover something now uh, related to the slip, okay? For the, uh, I can actually do it, so I can do it in, uh, I don't know why, what happened to the, have something with uh, okay. Let me close this one and open it again and see what happened with the PDF. This is the induction.
Okay. Yes. Let me do something and then return back to the. Yeah, I guess we. I know I'm not sure what happened with the PDF, but uh, yeah, let's cover this one. Okay. Now it's good. Okay. So let's do this equivalent circuit and what, uh, why we have the S in the equivalent circuit. So the circuit, this circuit I, I used for only the rotor side. Remember the rotor we have, uh, it was similar to the one we have uh, in the transformer. We have resistance for the rotor and X, it's, it's short circuited. So similar to the short, like short circuit transformer, the secondary one. And we have a voltage for the rotor. We have a current flowing in the rotor. The current in the rotor equals to the voltage divided by the R, like the impedance, this impedance, R, R plus J, X, R. Okay. We said we have a frequency in the rotor equals to the S frequency of the let's say synchronous or electric. Because of this, you will see that the, the resist, the, the voltage of the rotor equals to the voltage of the logged rotor times S. And you see there is S here. Similar to the X, X, because X, you can remember X equals to omega L and omega, you have a frequency. So X are the reactance of the rotor equals to the X of reactance of the rotor when it's logged. Because the frequency here is the electric one. The frequency here is the frequency of the rotor. So the frequency of the rotor is S times the frequency of the synchronous or the electric source. For the resistance, RR, we are going to ignore any frequency impact. So R in the logged rotor equals to the R when the rotor is rotating. There is something like, you know, for the resistance, there is something called the skin effect and they have some impact on the, the value for the resistance with the frequency, but it's not that great. We meant by a skin effect, if you have a conductor and normally at low frequency, the current is flowing in all cross-section area of your conductor. If you have high frequency, what will happen? All the current will go to the out, outer part of your conductor. Okay, and nothing will flow inside in the core. Okay, this one we call it a uh, scan effect with a high frequency, and the resistance will er, er, is going to change the value because it's rho L over the cross section area. Now, the cross section area, as you can see here, reduced, so the value of the resistance will be increased, but this happens only when we have very high frequency, like the difference between the frequency are high. The difference between the frequency of the rotor and the um, electric source is not that much. It's not like in hundreds or like uh, uh, thousands of times. So we can ignore the scan effect. So the value of the R, log the rotor and the, rot and the rotating, they are the same. I'm going to divide each of them over S. So the current will be the same, right? If you divided this by the same values, then it should be the same. You know, ER equals to the E logged rotor times the E, sorry, times the S. So now the voltage will be logged rotor. Let's 
R over S, you know, X R over S, it will be X L R. Now the R, there is no S for the R. So R will be R over S. R will be R over S. Okay. And you will have this value for the IR, similar value, right? For the IR. Now, the frequency here, we divided by S. So LR and XLR, because we use the frequency now of the FE, the frequency for this circuit, now the FE. The frequency for this one, it was the frequency of the rotor, which is S times the FE. This one, we changed the frequency after we divided by the S to the FE. Now we can do the referring. We can move to the stator, from the rotor to the stator. Because before, before doing this, using the frequency of F R, we cannot do the referring for the circuits with different frequencies. We have to go to the same frequency as the stator, the frequency of the source, and then we can do the referring. Okay. After doing the referring, what kind of frequency uh, or what kind of reactance we are going to use this and resistance this? So this is what you can see here. Okay, I'm not sure what happening is. Not sure. Let me try to, maybe because I opened the uh, Okay. That's, yeah, it's getting. Close and open it again. Maybe I can use different uh, versions of. I can. Do you have problem seeing my? Uh, because I I can see like white slides sometimes with the pdf i'm not sure what is the what is happening but yeah let me do it again maybe i can do it in um, smaller You can see this one is white, right? You cannot see the values here, right? Or uh, no, it's values. just what? Sorry, there is no is values. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure what happening with the PDFs here. Okay, it seems I have something with. I can need to reinstall the Adobe or something. I can use different um, okay, let me use different PDF. This, this is one of the I am going to share it using a different one. Okay. Let me share the screen with, okay, yeah, it's, if this one is much better, or at least we can try. Okay. I will make it, try to make it a uh, full screen. 
the view. Okay. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Is it better? I cannot see the total image, just part of the. Oh, okay, yeah. Maybe I can, I should do it like this and then we try to make it. Um, yes, I believe you now see it fully, right? You can see the full slides, right? Or? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thanks so much. So after doing this, what we did, we moved from the... Um, Okay. I can make it to the wall. So. Let's move it like this. Okay. After we use this uh, for the, um, we moved from frequency in the rotor to frequency electric. Now we can connect this part to the stator. We can move this to refer it to the stator using the force, as we said, the turn is ratio effective, A effective, and then you can connect it to the stator using the same values here. The one we divided it by the S, by the slip, okay? Okay, let's uh check the next slide for the equivalent circuit this is what we discussed we have the effective turns ratio for the rotor okay resistance and reactance so we have the one for the reactance x2 okay and we have r2 divided by S. I need to divide R2 divided by S to R2 plus something. So this one should be one minus S over S R2, right? If you put this one with a negative on the other side, so I mean by that R2 over S equals to one minus S over S, okay? R2 plus R2, right? Why I did this split? Because I need to split the rotor copper losses to something or with plus something else. We will know exactly what is this part, but this is the rotor copper losses, the R2 plus something. So we split the R2 over S to this value plus the R2 one minus S over S. From the power flow, we will discuss in the next section, the power flow is coming from the input. This is a motor, right? First, we have losses here, copper losses, core losses, rotor copper losses, and then we have this this one, the power converted. Converted, it means moving from electrical to the mechanical. So we can we can see it now. The power in this resistance is the power converted from the electric to the mechanical. Okay, and we call it here the power converted. You can see three phase I two squared R two times one minus S over S, okay? 
So it depends on the S. It depends on the slip, the power converted from the electrical to the mechanical depends on the value of the slip. Okay. So let's go to the next one for the power flow that we are going to discuss. We have the input power as a three phase. Input power, it's uh, let's use the line voltage and line current, cosine theta, you divide it by square root three. The first losses is the stator copper losses, SCL. Then this is the one for the R1. Then we have a core losses. This one for the R core, RC. We have the copper losses. This one is for the R2. Then we have the power converted here after the copper losses. This is the power converted. Okay. And we have the losses. The losses uh, mechanical. Okay. Which is the the, as we said, like it's the friction and the windage. This is mechanical losses. And final part is the stray losses or the miscellaneous. We call, we call it like the E for the stray. You have at the end the output power, mechanical, of course. This one is mechanical. This one is electrical for the motor. Okay. So... We have one important power, we call it like the air gap. It's jumping from, so the, the after the core losses, jumping from the, we call it air gap, in the air gap between electrical to the mechanical to the, from, let's say, from the, your source connected to the stator to the rotor. This power is very important. Sometimes in the exam, they are asking explicitly to calculate this power the air gap power or AG, okay? This power actually is the power at the R2 over S. Then, because we said R2 if, uh, over S equals to the R2 plus one minus S over S of the R2, right? Then this is the air gap power. Then you have the power at the rotor losses, then you have the power converted, which is this. So you can see the converted power is like this, is the power losses at this resistance. The air gap is the power loss at this resistance, R2 over S. Okay. You can see relationship between the air gap and the power converted, and it's important one. The power converted equals to the power air gap times this, it's the power air gap times this part. This is the power air gap, right? One minus S. The power output, it's the torque of the load, of course, times the omega mechanical. Okay, the rotation, the actual rotation. The torque induced, okay, times the omega m, it's the power converted. So torque induced equals to the power converted over the speed, mechanical speed, which equals to the power of the air gap, this one, over omega synchronous. How did I get this one? You can, because I know that the power converted is one minus S times the power air gap, as we said here. And I know that the mechanical speed equals to one minus S times omega synchronous. Now, remove the one over S, so it will be the power air gap over the omega synchronous. Okay. And let me show you the 
the power flow actually between or on the equivalent circuit. So equivalent circuit or the induction is very important. You have the power flow is like this. This is the input power here. The square root three V line I line cosine the angle or the power factor, etc. Okay. The first power losses is the stator copper losses here. Three I I one squared magnitude times the R one. Then the second power is the core losses. Then you have the this is the air gap. This is the P air gap, which is the one on this on both resistance here, the R2 over S. Then you have the copper losses for the rotor here. Okay, I, I put this is the core, this is the one, this is the stator, this is the rotor, and at the end you have the converted. You can have the output directly if you don't have mechanical losses, P mechanical and P stray. This is P out. This is the, here it's the rotor copper losses. Here we have the core losses, RC. Here we have the stator copper losses. This is the power flow for the induction motor. And it's very important. In the exams, you will find many problems related to uh, how you know the power flow. And it depends on the power flow. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Let's clear this one and go to the next part for the the power flow uh one one important point i i forgot to mention is related to the rc the core losses resistance for the induction machine normally we ignore the rc the reason is that the losses for the core losses is very very small compared to the other losses so even in the equivalent circuit you will find now most of the problems we are going to ignore RC. We will we will have one single branch, one single element branch is JXM. Okay, RC is very very big, large value, so we consider this part as open circuit. Okay, so for example, here you will find that this is the one. I'm talking about you. Yeah. Can make it. Uh... Okay. So this is the air gap power that we discussed that is jumped from one point to another. From actually to the stator to the rotor, because we have motor, right? So the power flow is from the stator from the source to the rotor. Okay. It's equal to the power absorbed at R2 over S. This one, which is equal to the R2 plus one minus one minus S over S R2. Okay. You can see here RC, we ignore the RC. This is the air gap for single phase. Of course, total, we have to multiply by the three. And this is the equivalent circuit that we are going to use with in like all the problems. Okay. And most likely RC is not there. If RC is given, then you put it. Okay. If it's given, because I saw it like in a couple of problems in the exams, but it's most likely they are ignoring the RC. Even in the equivalent circuit, we are going to ignore the RC. Okay, so we are going to cover 
next something called the Thevenin equivalent for the induction. Okay, mainly we cut the part for the stator and we are going to get Thevenin equivalent. Why we are using Thevenin and what is the reason for this? So we need to get the maximum power transfer from, you know, your electrical source to the mechanical. You need to get the maximum power or the maximum torque, let's say, torque. So how can we get this value? To do this, we are going to use the Thevenin. So Thevenin equivalent circuit is, you will have a circuit, two points here, and you have, for example, your load, let's say impedance ZL, you will try to get equivalent circuit. Okay. And this is the Z7. Okay. And this is V7 or V open circuit. After having this equivalent circuit, it's related to the maximum by, to get the maximum equivalent circuit, you need Z load equals to the Z7 conjugate or Z7 equals to the ZL conjugate. Like it doesn't matter. Like anyone is conjugate. So once the ZL equals to the Z7 equivalent, you will have the maximum power transfer from your source to the Z load. And for this point, you will reach to the value for the maximum. You will know the maximum power. If you change the impedance, then this value, your load, then this value, then you will have different uh, or less maximum power, at least like something less than the maximum power. Okay. So to do this, our load will be the this uh, the the stator like uh, sorry the rotor this is the rotor and this one is the stator you can see from the circuit that i got like the r1 jx1 uh, jxm ignore rc and then we let's get the v7 in the v open circuit here we need to get this part as source and impedance. The source is the V7, the impedance is the Z7. To get the V7, we do like open circuit. We open circuit the, or remove the router and get the voltage here. This is V open circuit, V7. Okay. Then to get the Z7, we make any voltage source as a short circuit. For example, this, I will make it as a short circuit and get the impedance here because it's, it will be this impedance, this reactance, for example, in parallel with this branch. After having this, you will have the load and then to make the load maximum, make it to the impedance uh, seven in conjugate. If you remember, like, I'm not sure if you remember the conjugate, the conjugate, if you have, let's say in polar form, three angle, 30 degrees, conjugate, it means you change the angle, uh, the sign of your angle, it will be minus 30 degrees. If you have conjugate with uh, a rectangular, three plus J4, it will be conjugate, it means three minus J4. Okay, this is the conjugate. We used it with the, in the power, if you remember the, the power uh, S to, to change the sign for the reactive power. So this is the conjugate. And this is the reason we use the seven equivalent is to calculate the maximum torque, maximum power transfer from your source to the mechanical. Okay, so let's let's do it. V7 is the V open circuit voltage here. To get this one, you have this voltage and divided into two parts. 
So for this, it will be the voltage. It will be the vol the original voltage times this impedance over the submission. This impedance, which is ZM, over the submission. Okay. You can get the magnitude. Okay. Uh, from this, get the magnitude. This is the magnitude. Okay. This is the magnitude. It will be this value. Next, let's get the Z equivalent or Z7. So for that Z7, it will be, as we, as we said, the two parallel uh, branches. One important thing is the assumptions. We have XM very, very large compared to the X1. And of course, very, very large compared to the R1. So you can do a kind of approximation for the V7. This is the one that we are going to use in the exam. Once you need to get maximum torque, for example, you will see one equation. The equation includes V7. This is the one that you are going to use to calculate the V7. For Z7, as we said, it will be X in parallel with uh, um, like R1 plus J X1 in parallel with the XM. But the submission XM plus R1, X1 is much larger than R1. R1 is a small, is very, very small value. So you can calculate this value for the R7 and X7. Uh, ignoring R1. Okay. So with this values, you will have V7 and Z. Seven and sorry, Z seven and make it Z seven. Z seven and equal to the R seven plus J X seven. Okay, you can actually put it like this as R seven and J X seven and V seven and, and you put the things for the rotor J X two and R two over S like the total. By this, you can calculate the maximum power and the maximum torque equations. So for the equations, you will have, for example, let's calculate the uh, current I2. Calculating the current I2, V7 over the impedance, get the magnitude of the I2. This is the rotor uh, current or I2. After calculating I2, you multiply by the R2 over S. This is the power okay, for the air gap. And then we, you have the power for the air gap. You divided by the omega synchronous. This is the induced torque. Okay. So you have the power for the air gap. 3I2 squared R2 over S. You have the torque. If you remember the induced, it's the P air gap over the omega synchronous or P converted over omega uh, mechanical. We are going to use the one for the air gap. At the end, you can get the maximum you know, like uh, R2 over S maximum equals to this, the 7 in, to get the 7 in equivalent value for the maximum power. So I said S max, the slip max, it's not like the maximum slip. It's the slip at the maximum torque or maximum power transfer from the source to your load, to the mechanical load. After getting the S max, I'm going to substitute at the torque equation here and get the torque 
max. So for the exam, we need to memorize these equations. What kind of equations? So let's just start. You need to have uh, from the previous uh, slides, the V7, okay? Z7, which is um, R7 plus J X7. How to calculate both, like R7, X7, V7. Then you have um, the S max. It depends, as you can see, it depends on the R7 and X7, right? Okay. S max, you have you want to get torque max. And it's good to have this torque also, like the torque equation. These equations, the six equations, V7 and R7 and X7 and S max, torque max, torque are very important for the problems to get the maximum tour. So the problem will be get the maximum torque, what is the speed at the maximum uh, torque? And sometimes they ask for the um, uh, torque at the starting. That's the reason I, I told you to try to um, memorize, or you can, as you will see, you can use it in your H sheet as part of the H sheet. Okay. Now it's much better because previously, when I started the course, we didn't have this H sheet. So you uh, or they had to memorize the equations. Now you have your H sheet. You can add the equa these equations on your H sheet as the part of the induction machine. Okay. So this is the one or this part is um, for calculating the maximum torque, uh, getting S max. As I said, S max, it doesn't mean maximum S, it's the, the, the slip at maximum torque. It's the slip at maximum torque. This equation is for the maximum torque. Okay, this equation is for general, Torque, okay. V7 and R7 and X7 here. V7, R7 and X7. Okay. How did we do the, the let's do like more explanation. How did we do like the equivalent? What we did is we said, for the seven to have like the maximum values, we need Z load equals to the Z uh, seven and conjugate, right? We said this is the Z load. So, and we added this to this reactance. So at the end, it will be, this is the reactance and this is the resistance, and the load, this is the load. So at the end, what we need to have, Z load equals the Z7 equivalent. Or you can remove the equivalent because you can say ZL magnitude and Z7 magnitude, right? ZL, it's the R2 over S. Of course, I'm going to say max because this by, by using this equation, it means I'm I'm driving the maximum, maximum torque, okay, or maximum power. And Z7, it will be the R7 plus JX7 plus X2. And this is what, of course, magnitude, both are magnitude, right? Because otherwise, if you are not using the magnitude, you have to use the conjugate. If you look at this, what I, I just said, you can apply and include it here. And you see, this is what exactly what we said. 
using the 7 n to get the maximum power at R2 over S. Okay. So it's good to know. They are not going to ask you for the equate, like for, sorry, for the proof in the exam, but they are, they, um, many problems ask it for the maximum torque, which speed the maximum torque happened. So you are going to use the S, um, R7 and uh, X7 and V7. And, okay. This is the kind of, of problems that we have. Any question before we continue to the torque speed characteristic? We have the torque speed characteristic and then examples, and that's it for the induction. Okay, maybe we can have a um, quick five minutes break, and then we can come back if you don't have any questions. Uh, sorry, Mohammed. I, I, yes, I do yes, have a please, question. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, sure. Yeah. So the main difference to me, uh, it looks like with the induction machine and the synchronous motor, because this is asynchronous, correct? Yes. yes. Correct. Yeah. I, I, is it the is it the fact that the synchronous has the um, the field excitation? Yes. That's correct. So the field and the excitation for the synchronous, you have a source for the field. It's a DC also, like it's a, it's not AC. For the induction, it's AC, but you actually taking it from the source, like from your source, if you have a motor, even if you have a generator, you are taking it from the grid. For example, if you have a wind, a wind you connect it to the uh, grid, it's going to take reactive power. The power factor for the induction is always lagging, always lagging. For the synchronous, because you have a source for the excitation, you can have leading, lagging, and unity power factor. But for the induction, it's always lagging, always absorbing reactive power from the grid. Because it's it, they don't have a source for the their field, their magnetic field. For the, yes, they have a pulse and they have, uh, magnetic field, but they are taking it from the supply, from the source. Yeah. Uh, another thing is that the speed in the synchronous speed, as we said, it's always synchronous speed for uh, even for the motors. Okay. Uh, for this one, no, the speed, as you said, like, or I, as you saw in the, in the motor, it's slightly less by the slip than the synchronous uh, speed. Synchronous speed is the it depends on the frequency of the supply. The mechanical speeds it depends on the slip, right? It's the slip from the uh, synchronous speed. If the synchronous speed, like if it, your motor is reached to the synchronous, then you will not have any um, voltage on the rotor, and no voltage, no current, no field. So it's going to slow down again, less than the synchronous speed, if it's a motor. Okay, if it's a generator, it's like a it's a different right. We will see it because you will have faster uh, speed than the uh, synchronous, right? It will be faster, so it can push more power to uh, to the grid, for example. I tried to make you know like um, a summary of the differences, but yes, hopefully it's uh, helpful. Thank you for that. It, it also seems like there's there's not the same stress on the number of poles, because I think that there was a formula in the synchronous where the um, frequency was based on like the number of poles times something divided by 120 speed speed yes correct. times yeah. the speed and rpm yeah over 120 we actually we are going to use this uh here in um, to get the syn the synchronous speed you will see in uh, solve the problems we are going to use the same equation to get the synchronous speed then we are going to use the slip to get the mechanical speed 
So the, we have number of pools in the induction. We have the synchronous speed only for the stator. We are going to use to have the synchronous speed in the uh, uh, stator, yeah. And then mechanical speed with the slip to get the mechanical speed in the rotary. Okay. Any more questions or? Okay, no more question. We can um, have a quick, um, maybe like five minutes break and then we can return back. Okay. Let me check, hopefully it will work. Okay, so we finished the, the one for the, maximum or sometimes we will use it for starting that's usually the problem you will see we are going to solve one today it's including like asking for the maximum uh, torque and the speed that the maximum torque happens and uh, the um, uh, starting torque next is the torque speed characteristic and this one is important too as a knowledge problem and to understand the tour like the induction in general so we have two um, torque speed characteristic, but uh, here I included only the generator, uh, sorry, only the motor. Uh, for the motor, you have, you can see, this is of course the torque, torque, and this is the speed in N, RPM. The torque is started at zero speed. This is the starting torque. And this, this is something good for the motor. It's a self-starting. It, it, it has like a, a starting torque, right? Then it reaches to the, here, we call it like the pullout torque or the torque max. This is what we calculated from the equation, okay? And this is the speed N max. It's not the maximum speed, but the speed that the, 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 the maximum torque happened, okay? And this is the full load uh, torque, okay? It looks like this, okay? At this speed, when you have zero torque, it's the synchronous speed. Usually the full load torque is, you know, relatively close to the synchronous speed. Okay. If your machine is not loaded, you will find it. It's very, very close to the synchronous speed, but not synchronous speed, of course. Okay. And this one only for the motor. You can, you can see multiple things here. First, you have a starting torque, usually or larger than the full load torque. So full, maybe like double as here or even more. You have maximum torque. It's a, a big one, pullout torque. Uh, the reason that we have a, st a starting torque larger than your load, so it can start your load smoothly. So if you have, for example, a torque here, it's larger than the starting torque. So once you start, you will not be able to start actually, like it's, uh, it should be less than your starting torque, your, your load, okay? This section, the section near the full load is almost linear. You can see it's, this one is almost aligned. Right, you can see it's almost a line here. This is a line. After that, it's not linear, of course. After the, so around the full load, around this area, it's a linear. Okay. That's, that's mainly it. I just want to say something about the slip. The slip at zero speed, this is zero speed, is one. Slip here is at synchronous speed is zero. Between zero and one, your machine is a motor. I can show you, I can show you, show you, sorry, like um, another one that includes everything, not just the motor. Not just the motor region that we studied or we, we saw, the motor region here, we are going to cover everything. So slip here is, 
like for the uh, zero speed, it's one. Step here at synchronous speed is zero. A slip here in negative, less than zero. A slip here larger than one. So for the motor, slip between zero to one. One at standstill, zero at synchronous speed. Okay. Then if your, ma your machine has larger speed than the synchronous, then it will turn it to be a generator. Okay. And this is the generator. Of course, the generator, you already have like another uh, torque, maximum, and so on. We only study the, the motor region, as I said. <laughs> For the braking region, the braking region, we will study uh, or we will have a bullet for this, but it's when your your speed is reversed. Like, how can I do this? Make the, instead of making a torque in anti-clockwise or counter-clockwise to clockwise, you have three phases, right? A, B, and C. You only flip two or swap like to any two phases, any two. By doing this, the rotating field will change instantaneously to opposite direction. So you will make a torque in the opposite direction. And this one, we use it like for emergency braking. We call it like, because this one is very aggressive braking. This is like a kind that you have in the subway. Like it's a very, very uh, strong braking. Okay use it for emergency, sometimes for, even for the shaft, it's doing some mechanical issues like uh, twisting the shaft because it was rotating in this direction and you suddenly apply another torque in the opposite direction. Okay, and you do it only by swapping to any two of the three phases of the supply. Okay. I believe that's set for the induction. Let's go through like some uh, summary of this. Um, one, as I said, one of the knowledge question was to draw the uh, torque speed characteristic. I believe it was for the motor. If they said for the machine, you have to do this. If they said for the motor, you only need to do the first one. That's it. This is motor region. This is everything, motor generator and braking. Okay, so let's go one by one here for the steps uh, or notes here. The torque, the induced torque of the motor is zero at synchronous speed, of course. When the S equals to uh, zero, you will find that R2 over zero is equals to infinity. So no power is going to from your P converted is zero, right? because it will be open circuit R2 over S, S is zero. So R2 over S infinity, it means open circuit. So there is no power um, actually in the air gap going from the jumping from the stator to the rotor. Second one is the torque speed curve is nearly linear between the no load to the full load. Remember this area, this one is very close to linear part. We will see like a problem, a solve it problem related to this, I believe. Okay. So it's like, you know, the rotor current, magnetic field, torque are all proportional with the slip. Okay, if the slip, if the torque increase, the slip increase and so on. There is a maximum possible torque that cannot be exceeded, definitely. And we said like it's a very large one. This is the torque max. Okay, sometimes you call it pull out torque, breakdown torque, maximum torque, and they are all the same. Starting torque for the motor is larger than the full load. Not just slightly, sometimes it's quite larger. Maybe as you saw here, it's almost double, right? 200 of the 100. Uh, percent of the full load. 
Okay. Um, this is important that the torque is proportional with the voltage squared of your supply. And uh, you can see this actually in the equation, right? The, the torque proportional with the voltage squared. Okay. So if you increase the voltage, the torque is, is increased um, more like a squared of the voltage. Okay. Uh, so if the uh, rotor for the induction motor is driven faster than the synchronous speed, this is, is going to, to be a generator. Then the direction of the induced torque in the same machines reverse definitely. And the machine uh, became, because S will be negative, right? So it will be reversed and then it will be a generator instead of like you are um, taking power to move your uh, or rotate your rotor, then you are going to use the power from the rotor to uh, your back to your supply, okay? If you have, let's say like a battery connected through converters, then you can take power, you can, and this is this is important because um, electric vehicles, for example, uh, during the braking, they are uh, using this kind of thing. So you have uh, not just the braking, even if you have like a car, electric vehicles, electric vehicles, and going to uphill and then down the hill. So during, this is the vehicle, during the downhill, it will be move very fast. Okay, and the speed will be higher than the uh, synchronous. So you can use this power to do braking by taking the power from your, your mechanical uh, power to back to your battery. So you generate, like you uh, charge your battery from this speed. And this is like making a kind of load on your, um, you know, like uh, on the wheels. So it's doing like a kind of like braking. We call it like regenerative braking. Okay. And this one, we use it for the electric vehicles just to, it's a good way to stop the car using this kind of energy to charge your battery. And instead of using like mechanical braking, for example, okay, which is like wasting your uh, power. Okay, I believe we have another point. It's the related to the braking. Braking, which is different than regenerative braking, this is like the emergency braking. If the motor is turning uh, backward relatively to the direction of the magnetic field, this is how can we do it? You can do it by, um, you know, like swapping any two phases of the three phases of your supply. Uh, then the magnetic field will be like um, rotated by or like uh, reversed and any, yes, as I said, like switching any two uh, stator phases and then use to make like a very rapidly stop of your, not just a stop, it can rotate in opposite direction actually, but it's, it will be very, very uh, tough braking. Okay. Uh, in this case. Because sometimes we call it like plugging. Yes. Yes, please. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, in this case, uh, Mohammed, what changes the the direction of the magnetic field when you exchange the the when you switch the phases? Phase, right. Yes, because when you have like phase A, B, C, if you uh, do it like A, B, C, if you look at this one, it rotate. You see A, B, C. What if it's moving in the opposite direction? You will see A, C, and then B. You can do this by using the normal A, B, C, and then move, for example, uh, or swap, switch both like C and B. Rotating at the same direction, it you will see A, C, B, right? It will be as if you make like, um, make the field, the magnetic field, rotating in the opposite direction. Okay, so just by moving two of your phases, you have your supply connected to your motor, 
So any two phases, you don't have to know which A, B, C, or whatever. So it was like this, just to change one of them. That's it. You will have in the opposite. And actually, you, we do this by having the switch, for example, in the subway. Uh, the emergency braking, it's something like this. It will be very aggressive braking. Very, very aggressive. Like it's um, emergency uh, and it's uh, impacted the lifetime actually of the shaft. Sometimes it damaged the shaft completely. Making like a twist because it was rotating in one direction and you apply the full power at the opposite direction immediately. Like without any you know, like a delay or something. Okay. Is it uh, clear or? Uh... Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. We call this one as a plugging or emergency braking. Yeah, okay, if you want to use that. I believe by this, we can go to the examples. We don't have a lot of examples um, and they are relatively easy. So let's start. The first one is uh, the first example is the star connected or Y connected induction. As we said, all the induction we have here are three phase and motors only motors and only three phase okay in reality there are generators for the induction and single phase too so voltage this is the voltage of course it's a line given it's a line you have the output power by the motor always the power given is the output rated power actually okay uh, here number of poles so you have the number of poles p you have a uh, frequency synchronous. This is the synchronous frequency. Star connected motor with a, has a full load slip of the 5%. So S equals to 5% or it's 0 0.05. Okay. We always use it with this format. They asked about what is the synchronous speed of this motor. We will use A. We are going to use the same uh, equation like the synchronous, like it's a Pn over 120. Sorry, 120. P is the number of the poles, the four, always even. Okay. N is the one that we need to get the synchronous. Uh, frequency is 60 and 120. So you can calculate the N synchronous. What is the rotary speed of this motor at the rated load? So rotary speed, okay, you can call it N rotor or NM, like the mechanical speed of your machine. So to do this, we have, you can use like N M equal to one minus S times the N of the synchronous. We already calculated N synchronous from the first step. S is given, S is given for the full load and they are asking for the rated load or the full load. So we can use this S like 0.05. Then we can calculate NM in RPM. I usually recommend to get the N, uh, or sorry, like omega M, just to multiply this by 2 pi over 60, especially if the torque is given. And they can see like torque here. So if there is a torque given, required, we need to get uh, omega in uh, radian per second. C. What is the rotor frequency? So rotor frequency equals to the S times the F of the um, synchronous, which is 0 0.05 times the 60 hertz. This is the S. Sorry, this is the frequency of the rotor, which is 
always less than the frequency of the least for the motor uh, frequency of the signals. Usually the S is something between like very low value, especially if it's um, like very, very low value, maybe like 0 0.01 or something up to maybe like six, seven percent, something like this. This is normally the values. Frequency of the rotor, something like between one hertz to few hertz, like six, seven, five hertz. Okay. I'm talking here about like the real values for the induction machines. D, what is the shaft torque of this motor at the rated? So torque equals to the power output over the omega m. As I said, we are going to use the omega m now. P out at rated power, I already have it here. We don't use the horsepower, so you have to use it in what? 10 times 746 to convert it from horsepower to watt. And this is the uh, torque in Newton meter. Okay. Any question for this part, this equation, like this uh, problem? I can show you like the answers for each step. So this is the synchronous speed. The first part one that we got like uh, in RPM, you got the NM, one minus S times the N synchronous. Frequency of the rotor, it's S times the frequency of the uh, synchronous. Okay, three Hertz, which is good. Okay, you, they have another one, you know, like it's uh, similar to what we used to do for the synchronous, you remember for the synchronous uh, frequency, if synchronous equal to uh, P times N synchronous over 120. You can do the exact same equation for the rotor. It's P over 120, but the speed is the difference between the synchronous minus the N mechanical. It's This is another equation for the rotor frequency, or you can call it it's S times the F of the synchronous. Okay, you can use either or, like you can use any of these two, two equations. I usually use this. If you want use this, that's okay. So the frequency of the rotor, it's like the difference between, it depends on the slip, right? It's the difference between the speed of the rotor and the speed of the synchronous of your supply, frequency of your supply. Torque is output over, uh, P output over omega, the torque. We have to make the power in uh, watt, the speed in radian per second, then you will get torque in Newton meter. Okay. No question, we can go to the next step. So this one is interesting. And you have a you have a, a voltage frequency output power. So this is the output power rated. Okay, so this is the rated output power. You have the C phase. Uh, induction motor is making this this current this uh, power factor without knowing you know like the um, I can get the input power without knowing if it's delta or star connected it's a square root three v line i line times the power factor right I have the power factor always lagging of course I have the current I have the voltage. And that, that this is the input power. I don't have to know if it's like star or delta. I will use the values here immediately. It's both lines. So I, I'm going to multiply by square root three and that's it. They included the powers here for the stator 
copper losses rotor copper losses with this value uh, friction and windage this is the mechanical core losses are this is our uh, sorry our C, uh, or we can call it tc core stray losses is not given or ignored they are asking for the air gap power so this one you can see from the problem very clear it's regarding the power flow so you start for, by pn which we already calculated then you have the power um, let's call it like the uh, stator copper losses then you have the core losses or pc i called it and then you have this is the air gap and then you have the rotor copper losses and then you have the converted here is the converted right and then you have some mechanical losses stray losses if given and then the output okay so they are asking about this power so it's the input power that we calculated minus this minus this and they have both one uh, sorry like one the stator and core you get air gap asking for the power converted this so this input minus stator copper losses core losses and rotor copper losses this this and the core and we already calculated the pn asking for the output power so input minus all losses okay uh, stray losses is not uh, is ignored yeah not given okay. efficiency output over the input times 100 this is eta output over the input times 100 uh, percent as i said range from 80 to 90 90 something percent 95 let's say for the motors okay even given the output power but this is the output rated right the the values here are not they didn't say it's in the full load right if they said it's a full load then i'm going to use the output power as 50 horsepower but this time they said three phase induction motor is drawing this cannon they didn't say it's is it full load or not definitely it's not full load otherwise they should say okay it's full load or rated power or something okay and they can show you like the answer the steps we you can of course draw something like this or at least you can draw it as a depth something you know uh, briefly having like a, the power flow the steps first to get the input power and then the air gap it's input minus short uh, uh, sorry stator copper losses and the core losses converted it's the air gap minus the core uh, uh, sorry rotor the copper losses output it's the converted minus the losses and then get the eta the efficiency efficiency is 88 percent that's a very good one okay so this is like a problem just for the power flow to understand the power flow okay let's solve this one because this one is very close to things that we you will see in the exam actually this one like a we 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 have it in one of the exams so you have the um, uh, voltage power p frequency of the synchronous uh, p out rated it's a star connected voltage this is the voltage line of course and you have all uh values are r1 r2 x1 x2 
and XM. Okay. Core losses, they said it's already uh, lumped in the with it with the rotational losses, and they're giving the rotational rotational losses, it means the mechanical losses. It's another name for the mechanical losses. And you have everything. You have R1, X1, you have XM, JXM, you have R, um, we can call R2, and then X2, JX2. And you can have the resistance here, the R2 times 1 minus S over S, right? They provided for the router, okay, they provided the S equals to 2.2% or 0.0, okay, 2, 2, right? This is the S. And asking you to, to get the values here. Okay given the mechanical losses. So mechanical losses is given. So this is the converted power. To reach to the mechanical load, we have some mechanical losses here or rotational losses, let's call it. You have the input power here and that's it. The first point is asking for the speed, the speed of the rotor, of course. We are going to, to do exactly what we did for the first example. First, calculate the synchronous speed from F equals to PN over 120. This is the synchronous, this is the synchronous. You have the number of pools, you have the frequency, you can get the n-synchronous. n-synchronous, why I use the, or how can I use n-synchronous to get the nm? It's equal to one minus S over the, uh, times the n-synchronous. You have the S given, then that's it. Use the N synchronous here and that's it. There is a torque here, so you can move the N uh, mechanical to omega M by multiply by two pi over 60 radian per second, because I, with the torque, I only use omega in radian per second. Okay, you need, this is the first step, you need to get the stator current, the I1 here. So to get I1, I have all the values here, right? All the values here, even I have S. So you can do like a circuit. You have this voltage, okay? It's like 460 angle zero over square root three phase here per phase. And try to calculate this current by getting this impedance and voltage over impedance. You have all the values. You have this branch in parallel with this, then in series with this. You can call R2 plus this one is R2 over S. So just to make it, uh, you know, smaller number of elements. Get this impedance. Okay, complex numbers, of course. Divided this one by the impedance, get the current as a magnitude and angle. The angle must be negative because it's always lagging. Just to make sure you get it right. Because the second one, they ask it for the magnitude. The second one, they ask it for the power factor. So cosine of this angle. But it's just, this is just a circuit, a very simple circuit analysis, right? To get the impedance, uh, equivalent impedance. You can actually try to uh, test your, your uh, you know, uh, calculator using the complex numbers. Asking for, next one, asking for converted and output power. Converted here and the output power here after the mechanical losses or rotational losses. So converted, I can get it by, uh, because the power converted is, I know it's, I can, first I can do the circuit, get this current, I2, it's a three I2 squared times this resistance, do, using the circuit, or I can use it by, uh, one minus S times the power 
air gap. I know the S, it's already given. Air gap, the power air gap is the input power, which I already calculated the input power, or like which I can calculate it actually. Um, if I have the current power factor and the voltage, you can calculate the input power minus 3i1 squared r1. I already calculated I1, R1 given. So it will be, this one will be very, or, or easier. Uh, if you like the circuit analysis, that's that's another another option. You can actually do both and check your answers in both. Now put power, all you need to do is just subtract this mechanical losses and that's it, the given here. Efficiency. I already calculated input and output. So output over input and check the values. It should be something like within 80 and, you know, like 50, uh, 95 or something percent. Let's see this one and that's it yeah, for today, but let's check the values and uh, we can, uh, if you have any question, you can, so this is the per phase, the values for the synchronous, okay, speed. This is how like they use the circuit analysis to do the part, they did it in, in a couple of, um, you know, steps, but you can do it like immediately if you are, you know, comfortable to do it. Then you get the current, the angle is always negative because it's lagging for the motor. Power factor with this lagging. Get the input power, the stator copper losses, get the air gap, converted power, output power, and at the end, you can get the um, efficiency, which is the output over the input. Okay. 30, uh, 93%, um, that's a very good number. So it's a uh, Good number for, I mean, for the machines within at least our range. We still have a couple of questions. We can uh, solve the problems. We can do it next time. No problem, no rush. But do you have any question so far for um, the induction machines in general? Or any question in, in the course? Okay, if no question, we can end our session and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mohammed. Good evening.